This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. This one should be really familiar territory, so I fought the urge to just make it in a different format, but I'm like, no, I'll stick with this guy's format. So, all right, great doctrines of the Bible. Oh, James doesn't want one? Well, there's John. Great doctrines of the Bible. This is actually lesson, I think, eight, so if you're keeping track, not... These do not go in progression, so you can mix and match here. Um, doctrine of sin is is not what we're covering. It's supposed to be salvation, so I found the first typo, and I'll have to fix that. The cro- Yeah, the picture is right. The rest is not. Okay, so review. Doctrine of the Bible. What was our four key elements there? Revelation. Revelation. You want to do all of them? Huh? All four. Yep. There we go. All right. So, doctrine of God. You're out for now. Might as well pick the early ones that we've reviewed a lot. I think Carl's going for doctrine of God. So, eternality, yes. He is now. There's a lot of books with this title. The Blank of God. Attributes, there we go. The idea of king. He's overall, he's in charge, he is. Not supreme, sovereign. And last one was Trinity. Okay, so Carl got some help there. Uh, Doctrine of Christ. To, nobody wants to answer now because I have to do all of them. <laughs> go ahead and catch. There you go. Good. All right. Doctrine of the Holy Spirit. P is probably the hardest one. Yep. Personality. Deity. Yes. His role in salvation and gifts. Good. All right. Doctrine of angels. Good. Wow. All right. Doctrine of man. Doctrine of man. It's fair game. Anybody can go for anything. You may now pull out your cheat sheets. Origin, yes. Nature, yep. No, that's true. But two, two more D's. Uh, the, we haven't got the first D yet. That's a good way to trick me to give me the answer, isn't it? What's the O? The O is origin. Origin. Nature. There's a reason we have men and women's restrooms. What? Yeah, yeah di- uh, distinctions. Uh, well, distinctiveness, that was the term. Yeah, As they're, they're distinct. And D, the last one. Destiny, yes. Okay, doctrine of sin. <laughs> 
We broke the mold on the doctrine of sin. Instead of four, we did five. Uh, doctrine of sin N. Yes, the nature of sin. I, I, my mind blanked, and I don't have them in front of me. So, and nature. Yes. F was fall. Yes, the fall. C was corruption. R. Yes, rebellion. Sin is rebellion against God. The last R that I added because they didn't. Remedy, yes. Remedy. So I probably said remedy or something, but it's remedy. All right. And what was the key verse on the remedy? Not John. It was a John, but not John. Yes, it was First John. I am absolutely sure. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's able and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, we are on the doctrine of salvation. Anybody want to take a shot at what the big fancy word for this is? Um, S? There you go. So, remember, ology is the study of, soteriology is the study of salvation. Um, I better not get away from myself. All right, overview. We're going to cover the basis of it, the result of salvation, the cost, and the timing. Uh, This lesson is going to be very akin to the gospel um, because this is what we articulate. However, when we articulate the gospel and we're talking about Christ saving us from our sin, we generally, in our minds, look at, we categorize people in, in two categories. What two categories are there? Okay, saved and unsaved. Is that where salvation ends? The moment of someone's salvation or being born again, is that where the gospel ends? Is done working or no? Okay. It's when it starts working. Okay. Well, and you could even say it started before that because it had a role in leading you to it, you know, but it's where it starts in your life, right? So, but sometimes in how we talk about the gospel and share the gospel, um, we almost make it sound like, um, I don't know, like you just got an engine overhaul and you're all good to go, you know? I mean, it's, it's not necessarily, the gospel is, it, it's the point when we trust Christ as our Savior, we are born again, okay? But that begins a life of living out the gospel, or it should. Um, and I might get into some errors on this either way. So just an overall verse for this lesson. If, you, if there's one passage of Scripture to put in your mind, and, and to me this is the simplest, um, 1 Corinthians 15 3 and 4, Paul says there, and 1 Corinthians 15 deals with the resurrection. Paul's proving the resurrection of Christ in that passage. He opens it, says, For I have delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, and here is the gospel in a nutshell, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and then he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So, what are the three elements right there that gives, that we present when we present the gospel? Okay. Okay. We have Christ, the person. Yep. We have his death, which deals with the penalty of sin. Okay. Uh, we do have his resurrection. Um, the resurrection confirms the other aspect, but you have the sin, the problem. So to put it in nice, neat, alliterated, the problem is sin. The penalty is death. The person is Christ. Okay. Now the The resurrection proves that he had power to do this. Because if he had died and stayed in the grave, then what hope do we have? Um, If he wasn't God, he would have died and stayed in the grave because there was not enough value 
um, intrinsic value if of one person. Um, I think of it this way. Maybe this isn't the best way to think of it. If Christ was human, if, this is all hypothetical, if Christ was only human and he lived a perfect life, which we understand can't happen, but if he died, I guess in theory he could have paid for someone else's sin, but one person's, one for one. But being God, he's intrinsically more valuable than anybody because he's the creator of all people. And so he is uh, more valuable than, than all, and that's, that's the value to pay for all sin and have enough surplus value to rise from the grave. Um, it, that kind of sounds odd. I'm sorry. Um, just how I view it. Um, number one here, the basis for salvation. It is a gift God gives to those who believe. Um, salvation is a gift God gives to those who believe. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This verse makes it pretty clear. Salvation is a gift. It's accessed by faith. And if it's a gift and it's accessed by faith, we're not going to get to heaven and brag about our own merit. Okay? Nobody's going to be boasting in heaven and all the good things they did to get there. Okay? Now, this verse has... Are any of you familiar with John MacArthur? Okay, and, and John Piper? Okay, those names... MacArthur's got some really good stuff. This verse, I listened to him do an exegetical sermon on, and he slaughtered it. And the question comes in, it is the gift of God. What is it? Okay, that's what we would say. So, But he's looking at the text, and he's, he's really, he's going, the it, is it referring to grace? Is it referring to faith? Now, the answer all of you gave is salvation, the whole package. Um, and that's really the best way my opinion, to look at it. For by grace are you saved through faith. You have the grace side, it's the grace of God, you have the faith side of man. Those two together are the package we call salvation. Both MacArthur and Piper, and although those two guys are are quite diverse and had uh, thoroughgoing Calvinists, will look at that it and say it refers to faith. Faith is the gift of God. What does that mean? And this is where sometimes logic can get you down a different trail than simple reading of Scripture. It's getting into the predestination. Because then, if if faith is a gift, and you get the gift of faith, but Kathy doesn't, you get to respond to God, and she doesn't. Okay. The other thing that happens here, and the reformers like Luther and Calvin, um, and truly, I want to be fair to John Calvin. Um, if anybody is, says, oh, I can't believe you read Calvin, I'm like, no, he's got some really good stuff. You should read him. But his predecessor, Beza, really took his thinking to the next level. And then the Calvinism of today, I truly believe if you could bring John Calvin back from the grave and he read the Calvinist of today, you're crazy. I mean, that, that's kind of, it, it's morphed into its own, it's a, it's a theological system that takes from cis- Scripture but imposes back to Scripture. Um, they all, but all the Reformers, almost all of them, they make faith out to be a work. Okay, so so your faith is actually work you do to earn the grace of God. Well, doesn't that seem counterintuitive? Because it's a gift. So, um, I just wanted to kind of bring that up. It's very clear in this verse, it says, not by works. So if faith is a work, then how does that work? How can it be by faith, but not by works, but faith is a work? It's, It's like, okay, guys, something's not right here. What's that? No, it's not. Faith is a response. Think of it this way. Um, Hebrews says Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. Okay? 
he prepared the way of salvation. He made it possible. Okay? We stand in a position of either accepting or rejecting. Now, it's not really a work we do, but rather a decision we make to accept or reject that. Depending on the decision we make will depend on the finishing of our faith. Because although Christ started the work, we respond to that. It's a faith response aspect. Christ finishes the work. He does the saving. We don't save ourselves, but we're, we're like the key in the ignition. If it's not there, it ain't going to happen. It's not automatic. It's not default. Does, does that make, make sense? Um, yeah, no, it, it's not a work. Um, but see, here's the thing. Sometimes how we talk about salvation and sometimes this to other people, we can make faith sound like a work. Okay, let me, let me, let me use a phrase that probably you've heard or probably you've said or, all you need to do is believe. <laughs> Wait, doing <laughs> is a work. <laughs> and believing is not necessarily a work, okay? Um, but I guess do is technically doesn't have to be in action. Doing, you know, all you, it's all you need to believe. But, yeah, the way we say it in the language kind of makes it come out funny. Um, uh, that's a good question. I can think of a chart in my head, and I wish I could pull it up right now. Um, anyway, go ahead. Right. God gives. See, to per se, he he provides the faith, though. Kind of can sound can. If you take that too far. It ends up with, well, God gave this person faith, but not that person. And that, yes, he gives us, um, God, okay, who has access to general revelation? And remember way back when we talked about the Bible and revelation, not the book of revelation, who has access to the general revelation of the fact that there's nature, there's a creator, Okay, who has access to special revelation? Okay, prophets, true. Uh, today, okay, anyone who's saved that has the Holy Spirit would have special revelation. Do other people have special revelation? Anybody can. You know, at least in America, can pick up special revelation at a bookstore called the Bible. Okay, it's specially revealed. So everyone has general revelation in that they have enough to know there is a God, and they have enough. He's bigger than me. Whether that's just creation, whether that's the conscience, um, the those different aspects there, they have enough to know that. The question then becomes with salvation, is that enough to save them? No. They need more. And God's modus operandi, or how he operates, to those who are seeking the truth, God reveals more truth. To those who reject the truth, God is not obligated to give them any more. Okay? So... Romans 1 is a great passage on this because they re, the people, we think, well, what about the, what about the native in Africa who's never ever heard the gospel? Okay, well, okay, that's true. They may have never ever heard the gospel, but what truth they have known, they've often rejected. And, um, so when mankind, if I offer you 10 bucks, and you slap me on the face and say, no. Will I come back and offer you a hundred? Okay. When God offers truth is he, and we reject it, is he, off, is he obligated to offer more? No. Now, at times in history, God overrides that. And even though people reject truth, he still gives truth to them. Okay. He, but 
we we cannot salvation only comes through faith in Jesus Christ which is why it's important to share the gospel around the world which is why missions is important however at the same time generally man, mankind does not respond well to truth we don't like it in fact the word Rome, Paul uses in Romans we suppress it. we like to keep it hidden um the chart that I'm, I was thinking of, I found, pulled up. Um, it's on my computer over there. Um, there's two, I'm going to classify it. When it comes to faith, um, how this works, I'm going to give you the reform view, which would be most Calvinists, um, general Protestants, probably almost all would take this. Not all Baptists would take this, um, but reform generally, it's Calvinistic theology. God gives faith man exercises the faith, then God enables. He gives divine enablement. What I'll call a revival view, or maybe a, what I think is more scriptural, God gives conviction, okay, which is truth. He shows us enough truth, so some, some bells are going off in our head, like, yeah, something's wrong here. I need to fix something. Okay, He gives us conviction. We exercise our will to believe. Are we going to believe what God says or not about the problem and penalty and payment of sin? Then, then we have faith that we, we exercise that faith and we receive that divine enablement where the Lord completes the process. Um, and so I don't, see, I see conviction as God presenting truth, not giving you, here, here's your faith card. So, you know, you're, you're automatically, you're in, you know, you can't, you can't get out. You know, you, you you're one of the chosen, and nobody else is. So, um, I view it as a very much responsive element. Yeah, let me let me put it this way: the more information I give you about something, does it increase or decrease your faith in that object? Okay. Now, if it's bad, if if you're getting the bad report. But the more reviews you read about a product, when you go to buy it, how much faith do you have in it if it's got a five-star review? Yeah, you tend to have more faith, okay? So God gives more and more, I don't want to say just information, but he's revealed more of himself. And the more we see him, the more natural it is to exercise faith. I don't like, like what you're hitting on, I don't like the view of faith like it's all stemming within me. That is Gnosticism at its core. Gnosticism is basically you are all gods and you just have to unlock your true potential. That's what I said, that they cannot be generated. No. It's a response. And so as we see God, we see his actions in history, it's, it becomes more natural to respond, okay? Um, if you borrow 20 bucks from somebody, or, or if, if somebody borrows 20 bucks from you, and the next day they hunt you down to give you that $20 back, and they're, they're giving it back five days early, how do you feel about that experience? That, that was good. Let's say, let's say in a, a year they come back and say, hey man, I'm, uh, can I borrow $100 from you, and I will pay it back within the month. And they pay it back within the month. What does that do? increases your faith. Now, nothing maybe necessarily has changed with that person, but the point is the more encounters and the more experience and the more objective things that happen, you say that, okay, I know this person is trustworthy. The more God reveals of his self, his character never changes. But the more we see him, the more natural it is to have faith. Which is why it's very important as we read the Bible, as we study Scripture, to keep centered not on man's problem, but centered on Christ. Because the more we see of Christ, the more natural it will be to actually trust Him and depend on Him. Does that make sense? Wow. I thought this was going to be a short lesson. <laughs> so, anyway. Okay. Number, any comments, questions there? We're getting some really good ones today.
Sure. Yes. I need to bring up two more things. Um, that was very good. One is faith is in Christ, not faith in faith. Okay. <laughs> and faith in faith sounds funny, but you see this every year at Christmas time. Just believe. You know, the magical element of just, just have faith. Believe. Anything is possible. Yes, Santa can come down your chimney and yes, elves can put things and whatever, you know, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, your belief does not alter reality. Our faith, and, and, and as believers, we sometimes struggle with this because we can, uh, did I have enough faith? Faith is like the switch on that wall. It's not a dimmer switch. It's on or it's off. It's on or it's off. Now, the, depending on the wires hooked up, will depend on how much juice can go through. If you've got really thin wires, you, you, it's on, but there's very little going through. Thus, the very little faith, a, a small measure of faith. But if, if you've been through this before, and like muscles, they build over time, and more use, they grow. Um, and you got a 10-gauge wire hooked to that switch, you can put some juice through that. So faith, oh, don't forget to turn your phones off. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> faith is like, electricity is actually a really good analogy for faith because how long can you, your faith go with how little evidence? Okay, that's really, there's a quantity and a quality of our faith. But our faith is on or it's off. So, and electricity serves a good because it's either on or and I can plug an extension cord into any of these outlets, but if that cord is not plugged into anything else, what good is it? That's what James is talking about. If your faith isn't plugged into something active and working out, what good is it? So, But when I plug that extension cord into a blender, now that blender access to the power it needs to do what it needs to do. But let's say I plug 10 crock pots in on the end of that extension cord, what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, it's going to melt down because I overloaded the faith, right? So, um, that, where was I going with that? The, 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 it can only carry so much as is able, which is, which is why uh, praying hide in India, when asked, why, didn't, why did you only pray for, I think it was 300 Lisu people, why didn't you pray for 1,000? His response was, God gave me faith for 300. I didn't have the faith for 1,000. So, so there's a level of faith where, and, and this kind of hits on the people who, do you know what I mean when I say name it and claim it? Yes. You know? I need a new car. I'm, God, I want a Cadillac. Give me a Cadillac. And it's like, um, okay, there's a level of faith here. Uh, I'm questioning motives. I'm questioning other things. Um, that's not faith. And some of the guys who do that, uh, if you really watch some of what they do, it's manipulation. But I don't want to go to the other extreme because I've been there when you know I need something or or I know a ministry and they need something and they pray and God seeks or God meets the need. Yeah, that's faith. You know, so um, like Brother Andrew and some of the others we've read about. Uh, there is a real element of faith, and faith, um, it's in Christ, and what he does is not in our own ability. No, it's not a work. Um, it, that, that confuses things. Now I forgot my second I had. I really did. I don't know. It's something to do with faith and something to do... I just can't. I can't. It will come back, I guess. All right, number two, the result. God extends forgiveness of sin and eternal life to those who accept him. 
Okay, Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So the result of our faith, the result of salvation, is we receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life and eternal life um, with with the Lord. Um, Romans 5 here has a word. Uh, what's it mean to be justified? Proven. That is an, I have not heard. That's an interesting thought to put with it. Because, okay, I hold that. I want to connect that with, how else would we describe Justified. Okay, just as if I've never sinned, okay? Um, the proven thought's interesting. So the justified deals with our position, not, not as much our history. Okay, so then the proven, what proves your position? Okay, <laughs> hey, wait a minute, that's circular reasoning, and I can't do that one. But... But what proves our justification is the blood of Christ. And he's seated forever at the throne on high. And he's he's the judge. Um, But he's our mediator as well. So we have someone, we have an advocate with the Father who continually proves our case. But justification deals with, like I said, position. Okay? You ever known anybody? who is in the position of CEO, but they have no idea what they're doing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Happens. All- you know, the, what do they call that? The, I think it's called the Peter Principle, where someone gets promoted and they do well where they are, so they keep getting promoted up the ladder until they reach a level that they are incompetent. Whether it's socially or whether it's work-wise or just the difference of the task, and and they get elevated one level above what they're competent, and they they just fail, you know. And so they need to be demoted back to that level they excelled and let them stay there, okay. Um, our f- justification is positionally we are righteous. Why are we righteous? Is it because of what we've done? Okay. The judge proved it to us. In our history, we have a bad record. But that record has been cleared, has been paid. Not wiped under the rug, but dealt with. Okay. Um, if I went out and stole something from the store, I got caught, I paid the fine for stealing, and then I had to do so much time of, of community service. Okay, if I did my time of community service or whatever and whatnot, paid back the item, am I still guilty? But my guilt has been dealt with; it's been paid. So I was guilty. It was paid for. Now I'm going to live with guilt, and I'm going to live with the reputation because, like we talked about, sin has that way of affecting everything. Yes, but I am. According to the law, I'm now an upstanding citizen. Now, I do have a track record, and we're not dumb to forget track records, all right? The same is true when it comes to our salvation. The moment someone trusts Christ as their Savior, they are saved. The Holy Spirit moves inside. Does that mean they're instantly going to be Mr. Nice Guy, Perfect Christian? No. Positionally, they're righteous. Practically, we got some work to do. <laughs> we need more practice, yes. That's why doctors are always practicing, right? They always need... <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we have two things going on there. We have the, pos- I am the positional righteousness and then the practical everyday living out of righteousness. Paul here is saying we're justified by faith. Um, we ha- because of that, 
we have peace with God, and that's through Jesus Christ. Um, in Second Corinthians, and I'm going to get to this more next week, I think. Um, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, that doesn't seem to quite fit with what we've been talking about justification because we're positionally made righteous, but we're not necessarily automatically practically righteous. But as we are positionally righteous, it will start to affect or should start to affect our practical righteousness. Does, does that make sense? Like It doesn't always work that way, but it should, or it could. Uh, next week, we'll get into the cost. And man, I thought I'd finish this week. I told my wife I was so proud of myself. I, I finished my lesson last week, and I didn't this week. So anyway, we'll close out. And uh, it's familiar turf, familiar territory, but there's been a lot of confusion, I think, on this, this topic in this realm. Um, and so thus we've got lots of discussion, and that's good. Lord, we thank you for your gift of grace and that you give us and you save us from ourselves, from sin. And Lord, we look forward to the day when one day we will be saved from the presence of sin and, and forever live with you. And Lord, we, we thank you that it's not anything that we merit or earn, but it's simply um, when we exercise that faith and, and just looking at what you've done, and we respond to that. And we ask that you would, um, Lord, give us faith this week as we respond to the situations of life that uh, come upon us and the, the th- and just the different trials and pressures. Lord, would we would we not respond to those um, in fear and unbelief and and in the flesh, but rather, Lord, would you enable us to respond, uh, to turn to you and depend on you, to to see what you're doing in the circumstance, to to work all things together for good, and to watch you um, get get involved in our lives. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen.